By the 1830s, canals were widely seen to be the best means of transportation available in the United States. Canals had given rise to cities like Buffalo, New York, which became a center of trade as goods moved east from the newly settled western lands. Although they're largely forgotten today, having been rendered nearly obsolete by rail and roads, canals at one point were the be-all and end-all of transportation technology that could virtually guarantee prosperity for any town that they passed through. Hoping to get in on the game, Indiana planned the massive Central Indiana Canal Project, which was intended to connect the Ohio River to the already existing canal network. And then, everything went wrong. It is history that deserves to be remembered. The end of the revolution left the United States in possession of an enormous piece of land, larger than any country in Europe, from the East Coast to the Mississippi River. Moving west was largely seen as a vital part of the nation's future, and soon thousands of settlers were working their way across the Appalachians. Without motorized transportation, goods and people could only be moved by ground or water, and rivers served as natural highways. Canals, man-made projects connecting rivers and serving as their own highways, became a central part of American infrastructure. To recognize the history of the country's many canals, the Syracuse, New York-based William G. Pomeroy Foundation has begun a program to fund historical markers telling canal history. A letter of intent for markers is due by May 4, 2022. Eligible organizations, nonprofits, local, state, and federal government entities can apply, and more information is available in a link in the description. As early as 1786, George Washington had been influencing the development of American waterways. At Mount Vernon, commissioners from Virginia and Maryland met to consider the navigation and improvement of Potomac. According to the 1908 Inland Waterways Commission, it was one of the reasons why commissioners from all states met in 1787 in Philadelphia in what became the Constitutional Convention, whereby the 13 original states were united primarily on a commercial basis, the commerce of the times being chiefly by water. The Northwest Ordinance, which organized the region that would become Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio, stated in Article 4 that the navigable waters leading into the Mississippi and St. Lawrence and the carrying places between the same shall be common highways forever and free. The first navigable canal in the United States to be completed was the South Hadley Canal in Massachusetts in 1795. Already there were many canals planned, usually built by joint stock companies. It wasn't until after the War of 1812 that the federal government became committed to internal improvements and transportation among the states. The first, and perhaps one of the greatest, public-built canals was the Erie Canal in New York, financed by government-issued bonds. The Mammoth Enterprise was completed in 1825 and spanned 363 miles, connecting Lake Erie to the Hudson River and from there to the ocean. The success of the canal is difficult to overstate. The canal cut the cost of transporting goods by 95%. It led directly to the rise of New York City, where the Hudson River opened to the ocean, giving the port an enormous advantage in the influx of western goods. Towns boomed along its length, including Syracuse, Buffalo, Utica, and Rochester. Within a year, tolls had paid for the construction's debt. The growth and industry created thanks to the canal were one of the primary reasons for New York's ascendancy as a cultural and political center in the 19th century. The success immediately led to further canal projects that hoped to reproduce Erie's success. Dubbed Canal Fever, cities and states began to plan and construct more canals, certain of instant reward. In the years between 1816 and 1840, more than 3,000 miles of canal would be dug, crisscrossing the country and opening new avenues of travel. The canals were frequently connected via rivers, creating even larger networks. In Indiana and Ohio, the Wabash and Erie Canal would become the largest canal built in the United States once it was finished. The journey to building the canal was a long one. In 1816, when it achieved statehood, most of the Indiana population lived along the Ohio River, the only significant trade route. Early projects became victims of the Panic of 1819, which caused both of the state's banks to collapse and forced the projects to be abandoned. In 1824, Congress agreed to assist the state by authorizing a 320-foot-wide land grant along any route a commission could decide on, but opposition in the state led to the plan's failure. In 1827, a second land grant was passed, this time giving the state a half-mile-wide land grant for a canal route. The main canal would connect the Maumee River to the Wabash River, though the project would continue well beyond that, and would connect to Lake Erie via an Ohio canal project that reached Toledo on the lakeshore. 
The southern part of the state still objected, as it would primarily be their taxes that would support such a canal, and Governor James Ray thought canals were a waste, preferring to support railroads. Nevertheless, construction began on the canal on February 22, 1832, the centennial anniversary of George Washington's birth. The early evidence from use of the slowly growing canal was positive, and trade along it was already significantly benefiting Fort Wayne and the Maumee River. In 1834, the state was able to appropriate $200,000 for construction, with the intention of extending the canal to Lafayette. In 1836, the Indiana Assembly created legislation that became the Mammoth Internal Improvement Act, which dramatically expanded public transportation projects was initially envisioned to fund the Wabash Canal, but as different parts of the state objected that their constituents would see little benefit, eight projects were eventually authorized, including railroads, several canals, turnpikes, and even road pavement projects. Included was a plan for the Central Canal, which would connect Indianapolis to the canal system and reach the Ohio River at Evansville. Two million dollars had already been borrowed, and three million more had been raised through land sales. The legislation proposed borrowing another $10 million to fund the projects. Very much a part of canal fever, it was expected that the plans would quickly bring in funds, just as the Erie Canal had done for New York. There were, however, some ominous signs. The state annually took in less than $100,000 in taxes. And in fact, $10 million was more than the total of the state's taxes since it had become a state in 1816. The money appropriated represented a full one-sixth of the wealth of the state. Other canals were also planned to connect to the Ohio River, and the Wabash Canal was to be extended further to Terre Haute. Legislators believed that from start to finish, the canals would improve local economies, but had not surveyed the land that the canals were to be built through. The projects would also be affected by national politics. In 1833, President Andrew Jackson had forced the closure of the Second Bank of the United States, and Indiana had established the Bank of Indiana. Most of the money was raised by mortgaging state land to the bank. Additionally, legislators had failed to pass a tax increase that the governor thought would be necessary to pay for the projects. Despite those issues, the bill's passage was greeted with celebrations across the state. Owing to its perceived value, the lion's share of the funds went to the Central Canal. Almost immediately, problems arose. Instead of working together, the various projects competed for money and labor. Unsurveyed land proved to be unsuitable for many of the projects. The Central Canal was surveyed after the passage of the bill, and the state already owned most of the land it needed for construction. The canal was designed to be 60 feet wide and 6 feet deep, and the path chosen would connect the Wabash Canal at Peru before traveling south to pass through the center of Indianapolis, and then southwest where it would join the Wabash Canal until it reached Evansville, near the border with Kentucky, a total of nearly 300 miles. The Central Canal began construction shortly after the passage of the bill in 1836 and was to be fed by a feeder dam north of Indianapolis in the town of Broad Ripple. Construction was hampered by the heavy forest that lay between Broad Ripple and Indianapolis, which had to be cleared by hand before the canal could even be dug. The canal was dug up slowly using man and animal power, and towpaths were built on either side using the removed ground, where horses or mules would be able to pull the boats along. Construction on an eight-mile section from Indianapolis to Broad Ripple came along nicely and was completed in 1839 and ready for use. Celebrations on its completion were held in Indianapolis, but the financial situation was quickly becoming dire statewide. While construction had begun in some places for the rest of the Central Canal, most of the other projects were floundering. The most serious obstacle was the Panic of 1837. Panic was caused by numerous issues, both internal and international, but one problem was the lack of the Central United States Bank, which meant fiscal matters went largely unregulated by the federal government. On May 10, 1837, banks in New York City began to run out of gold and silver, and ultimately payment in the metals was suspended. A bank run immediately followed, and the economic collapse rippled across the country as banks closed. Profits, prices, and wages collapsed, and unemployment rose. Indiana had been counting on tax receipts to pay for the interest on the huge debts it had incurred. In 1838, the governor reported to the assembly that the year's tax revenue was only $45,000, but that interest on the debt was nearly $200,000. Instead of cutting their losses, the assembly doubled down, borrowing money to pay the interest in hope that the projects could be finished before they ran out of credit. By the following year, the continuing depression, which would last well into the 1840s, made the position untenable. $8 $8 million had been spent, but only 140 miles of canal had been built, most of it in the Wabash and the Whitewater Canal. $1.5 million was spent on a railroad meant to reach Madison, Indiana from Indianapolis, which was still not finished, in turnpike construction. 
There was simply no money, and in 1839, construction faltered and failed on most of the projects, including the Central Canal. The state had over $15 million in debt and almost nothing to pay for it. By 1841, the budget had over a half million dollars dedicated to paying debt, but brought in only $72,000 in income. Promises that taxes would not be needed strangled the assembly. The most starkly disappointing disaster was the Central Canal itself. Of the 300 miles it was meant to cross, only 24 miles were finished around Indianapolis, the rest being deemed ultimately unsuitable for the construction of a canal. The entire project, which cost around $3 million, was considered a loss. The state attempted to save itself by handing over control of all the projects to debtors in London for a reduction of 50% of the debt, but the state still couldn't cover interest payments. Portions of some of the canals were used to some success, but only the Wabash was fully constructed, reaching the Ohio in 1853. Even that was at best a mixed success, as the last canal boat made its final docking in 1874. Much of the canal was already in disuse by then, replaced by faster railroads and hampered by high maintenance costs. One major issue were the muskrats, which dug into the canals and caused the collapse of its banks. By 1845, Indiana was forced to default on their debts, and the crisis was only solved by handing over the majority share of the Wabash in exchange for yet another 50% decrease of the debt in 1846. The Madison-Indianapolis Railroad was eventually finished after being sold to private interests, and much of the canal land was sold to other interests. The story of the Central Canal doesn't end there. It was used in the 19th century to power the water system for the city, and in 1904, the Indianapolis Water Company used the canal as a source for a water purification plant. Eventually, the canal in downtown Indianapolis was deeded to the city, and in 1985, the city reconstructed that section as a tourist attraction, complete with a gondola and paddle boats. And the debacle was not wholly without a silver lining. Land values in the state increased fourfold. Where projects were completed, transportation costs plummeted. Investors in the bank made substantial profits, which were reinvested in the state, forming the foundation of the state's modern economy. Two, Indiana wasn't the only state that was facing bankruptcy in the 1840s. In fact, ultimately nine states defaulted on debt in the 1840s, many in similar situations to Indiana. Despite being considered one of the greatest debacles in Indiana history, at least the section in Indianapolis has become something of a success story. And the sections that stretch away from the city continue to provide water to nearby areas and serve as a unique habitat for turtles, showing that there can be some unexpected benefits, even from a near-total disaster. The William G. Pomeroy Foundation has opened a grant period for the funding of canal-related markers, and eligible 501c3 organizations, nonprofit academic institutions, and local, state, and federal entities are eligible to apply. The markers must be installed near a current or former canal site and must recognize a fact that occurred more than 50 years earlier from the date of the application. More information regarding the process can be found at their website, wgpfoundation.org slash history slash historic dash canals. For the current grant period, a letter of intent must be submitted by May 4th, 2022. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.